My name is Josh Breslow and I'm here to bring you all of your top stories from across the country and across the world. I do want to head to a big one right here as President Biden ordered the U.S. military to carry out retaliatory airstrikes against Iranian-backed militia groups after three U.S. service members were hurt in a drone attack in northern Iraq. National Security Council spokeswoman Adrian Watson said that one of the U.S. troops suffered critical injuries in the attack. I want to talk about all of this information and what we know so far, so let's bring in Henri Barkey, a professor of international relations at Lehigh University. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us and help break this down. Thank you. So first off, what do we know so far about this situation and how it played out? Well, I mean, this is an organization, uh, Kataib Hezbollah, which is an Iranian-backed Shia militia in um, in Iraq and Syria, which has essentially followed the Iranian uh, playbook. And when the Iranians want to create trouble for the United States in uh, in the Middle East, they it's one of the groups that they use. And in this particular case, they attacked uh, an American base in northern Iraq, in the Kurdish parts of Iraq, in Abil Airport, which is actually an important base for the United States. Um, the United States has troops in northern Iraq and northern Syria be, uh, left over from the war against ISIS. If you remember, in 2014 to 2016, ISIS controlled or took over large chunks of Syria and um, uh, northern Iraq, and it was only United States intervention that allowed the local forces to defeat ISIS. And ISIS, you remember, the Islamic State was a very vicious uh, organization. So those troops are still there because ISIS continues to have a um, presence. And uh, so we helped the, our allies, Kurds in uh, Syria and, and Kurds in Iraq, as well as the Iraqi government, to fight against ISIS, continue to fight against ISIS. But the Iranians um, very often attack us uh, just to create trouble. And they've been doing it more frequently now, taking advantage of the war in Gaza. But I should point out that in 2011, for instance, they, these groups attacked American installations twice and, kill, and killed, in one case, three American uh, Americans contractor and two soldiers, in another case, another three. So it, there hasn't been really many lethal attacks since then, but they've, they've done, they've attacked. And so the administration clearly wants to make sure that they don't do this again and pay a price for it, so they, they hit back. And that's what I want to ask you next is about the retaliatory airstrikes. How exactly is the U.S. responding here and how significant overall is that response? Look, it's not as if the, <laughs> the administration tells you exactly what they hit and what they did because it's usually classified information. Um, in this particular case, we know that the the Defense Department has said that an, a large number of Kataib sol soldiers or militiamen were killed. Is it correct? I, I, I don't know. I mean, they may ha they have their own ways of, of um, ascertaining that. But you can be sure of one thing, though. Uh, the U.S. has enormous amount of firepower now in the region. I mean, the United States sent two carrier groups to to the Middle East after the Gaza war started. So if it wants to do damage, it can do enormous amount of damage. And it, then this may not be, by the way, the end, the end of this. I mean, the administration may hit again tomorrow or a few days later when the, you least expect it. Um, and I think maybe they should because they want to, if they want to deter the um, the Iranians from doing things like that. But for the Iranians, this is a cheap shot because it doesn't cost them anything. It's not Iranians who are necessarily suffering here. Uh, they're using Iraqis as cannon fodder. And they are creating also, by the way, problems between the Iraqi government, which over which they have enormous amount of influence in the U.S. government. So it, it, for the Iranians, this is, this is a perfect um, play because it shows that they're getting involved in the Gaza war. It shows they, they're attacking the Americans. It creates problems for the Americans in um, in Iraq with the Iraqi government. And 
the cost essentially is a few um, Iraqi militiamen who die and some installations destroyed. So it seems to me that if Washington wants to deter them further, they will have to take more concrete action. What is the U.S. relationship, or I guess lack thereof, between you know the U.S. there and Iraq at this moment? Iraq? No, there is a relationship with Iraq. I mean, the Iraqi government and the United States work together on a whole series of things. The issue is, is the current uh, prime minister, al-Sudani, does owe a great deal of his support in parliament to pro-Iranian groups. So he's caught in between. And um, so, but look, the Iraqi government uh, and the Iraqi state would probably not survive very long without American support, both uh, military and financial and political. So um, for the Iraqi government, it's, it's, it's difficult. I mean, the Iraqi government came out this morning saying that they condemned the American both attacks, both the attack by the by the Iranian pro-Iranian militia and the the American response, and you realize they're trying to balance both sides, and they'd rather not do it, obviously. No, that makes sense. Well, this is just the latest of Iran-aligned militia attacks on U.S. assets in Iraq and Syria. Uh, we can see some of the maps here that show some of those attacks as well as that location there, but. Is it likely that these attacks are going to continue? Oh, yes, they will. Um, I mean, as, first of all, as long as the Gaza war continues, it creates essentially a nice background, if you want, for them to take action, to say they are supporting the Palestinians in Gaza, and therefore, by attacking the United States, which is the Israel's main supporter. So, I mean, that I think it will continue. And this is why I think that it is possible that the administration may take more concrete action um, without waiting for another attack just to disrupt things in advance. Uh, but I can't, I wouldn't, I'm not in, in a position of knowledge if they will or will not do that. But you can be sure that these attacks will continue. And I want to talk about another topic here. We know that Turkey has carried out airstrikes in Iraq and Syria within the last, I would say, few days. Is any of this all connected? What can you tell me about that? No, that's completely independent of what we're seeing. The, the, the Turks suffered um, 12 casualties in two incidents. There's a, there, there has been an insurgency in Turkey by Turkish Kurds for a very, very long time. The insurgency within Turkey is almost um, finished, if you want, but the main group that engages in that, the PKK, is ensconced in the mountains of northern Iraq, where, especially in the winter, the conditions are very, very tough. So the Turks have been um, acting both in northern Iraq and in northern Syria. They have sent their troops, they have bases in northern Iraq. They've been fighting the PKK for a long time not with much success. I mean, they have reduced the PKK's abilities, but what happened this week, which was really surprising, was that the PKK managed to ambush in two occasions Turkish troops, and this is the largest number of uh, Turks, uh, Turkish soldiers killed in action in a very, very long time, and I think it shocked um, the, the Turkish government. And it also made the Turkish government look pretty bad because there were pictures that emerged in the Turkish press of the conditions under which those Turkish work, soldiers were fighting in northern Iraq. I mean, they were in shabby little tents um, in deep, deep snow with no heat, nothing. And these pictures emerge in, in social media, etc. By, by the soldiers, so the soldiers had sent them to show how bad the conditions are. So the Turkish government is really embarrassed, both by these pictures and by the number of casualties. So they are uh, attacking, and you will see these attacks continue for for a while, and there will be more Turkish troops crossing. This this is also another problem for the United States, like paradoxically, unrelated to the Iranian attacks, because the the. the the United States has been cooperating with a Kurdish militia in Syria that the Turks do not like. 
that the Turks think is part of the enemy. And it has created serious problems between Turkey and the United States. And so the Turks occasionally bomb these uh, allies of the United States and sometimes even endanger American soldiers and personnel who are co-located co with, with the Syrian Kurds. So that we may see more problems in, um, in, in uh, 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 rela related to that as well. But it is completely unrelated to what the Iranians are doing. Although for the Iranians, this may be also another little check in their favor, if you want. But, um, but those two are unrelated. And I want to talk about another big topic that we've been discussing here, and that is, of course, the Israel-Hamas war. Does it appear from what you've seen as we have all of these different incidents and, and actions that are taking place across the Middle East, is this leading to a larger regional conflict? Is it all connected? Well, there is always a possibility of a larger conflict. We saw two um, there are two flashpoints at the moment. One is in the Red Sea, where Iranian-affiliated militias in Yemen, the Houthis, have been attacking the shipping lanes and have created enough consternation among shipping companies that shipping companies are rerouting uh, their ships across the, the Cape of uh, Good Hope around Africa, which causes, obviously, uh, delays and extra costs. Although, uh, one of the, the largest shipping company has just announced that it will resume its shipping through the Red Sea because the United States and a, a number of allied countries have decided to patrol the Red Sea to prevent these kinds of attacks. That's one flashpoint. Um, in, in a way, it's not very significant because um, it will not lead to a war. I mean, there may be retaliatory attacks on, on the, the Houthis in Yemen, but that's not a war. The more important flashpoint is on the Israeli-Lebanese border, where you have Hezbollah, another Iranian-affiliated but amazingly large group that controls over southern Lebanon. Now, it is possible that the Iranians may order um, Hezbollah to attack Israel, and they have the capability of launching tens of thousands of missiles on, on northern Israel and beyond. I, and if that were to happen, then all all hell's going to break loose. I mean, that that will, that will be will emerge into a major uh, regional conflict. So far, you've had skirmishes. You've had um, Hezbollah attacking Israel occasionally, and Israel is retaliating, but it has not gone. It has remained within, shall we say, some constraints, but. You never know. I mean, if 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 the Iranians decide that the Gaza war is not going the way they would like to see um, evolve, they may decide to do it. Again, remember, this is something that doesn't cost the Iranians that much because it doesn't necessarily involve the Iranian territory and it doesn't involve um, many Iranian um, assets, you know, in terms of soldiers, etc. But it is also possible that the Iranians may, if there is such a conflagration, that the war may, may be taken to Iran. We don't know. But um, but there is always that possibility. I don't think it's a huge uh, probability. I mean, maybe 20%, 25%. Uh, I would bet against it at this stage, but it, we have to be always aware of it. and. You can be sure that the Biden administration is doing everything in its power to prevent that from happening. And when the United States, at the beginning of the, uh, the war, so after the October 7 attacks on Israel, sent two carrier groups uh, with huge assets to the Mediterranean and, and, and the Red Sea area, it was basically designed to send Iran a message not to uh, get the, the, the Hezbollah allies in Lebanon into the war. Um, and it has worked so far. I mean, I think the, uh, that much U.S. power, and it was it, it was really a brilliant move on the part of President Biden because he acted immediately. And remember, it takes time for these flotillas to move. 
and to get into location. And um, so, so far it has worked. And I suspect that still remains a major deterrent on Hezbollah action against, against Israel. All right. Henri Barkey, Lehigh University, a great conversation there, a lot of detail, and we appreciate it because you can help break this down for us and for everyone at home. So thank you again for taking the time to be here with us. Is there anything else you want to add before I let you go? No, it's uh, there's going to be more of the same as we go along. All right. Thank you again for taking the time to join us, and I'm sure we'll have you on again very soon. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. All right, I do want to take a look at some of the statements here that were released in response to the situation. You have Lloyd Austin here, Secretary of Defense, saying, quote, while we do not seek to escalate conflict in the region, we are committed and fully prepared to take further necessary measures to protect our people and our facilities. We also had this statement that was released by the National Security Council spokesperson earlier today saying, quote, the president places no higher priority than the protection of American personnel serving in harm's way. The United States will act at a time and in a manner of our choosing should these attacks continue. As we get more developments on this, we will bring those to you right here on Live Now from Fox.